Hello, everybody. Welcome to Meet the Devs. I'm Carl Quinton, I'm Production Director at uh, CGA, and it's uh, great to have you with us again today. Today, I have uh, Aaron Waltz with us. Um, Aaron, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Carl. Good to be here. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to have you uh, on the phone and to talk to you. I've uh, known you for quite a few years, and uh, it's uh you've you've done a lot of audio stuff over the years uh helped casual connect do like um audio content and like mixers and you know we had that uh one little bar escapade down in San Francisco in like 2014 and had a bunch of audio people there so uh i i'm really excited to have a in-depth conversation about uh video games and audio and your expertise there um, so I was going to start off the show with, uh, you know, where you got started. Uh, we talked about it a few days ago, but, uh, if you want to let everybody know, you know, how you got started into video game audio, that'd be great. Uh, sure. Just stop me when I say too much, cause I can talk a long time about that. <laughs> uh, so I started game audio when I was a little kid and I was learning how to play piano and learning how to play songs that I heard on the piano, like Super Mario theme and Tetris and all of that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I kind of always knew I wanted to do game audio. And then I guess in the early 2000s, I started um, just kind of contracting and composing for uh, mostly indie developers. So I think my first major indie developer hit was the Avion series by Amaranth Games that was published by Big Fish. And so that was all uh, music composition. And uh, after that, uh, basically, I I started going to Casual Connect around 2006. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was 2006, maybe your second year. I uh, met a lot more clients, um, started speaking about audio and mostly composition, and then kind of quickly found that I needed to learn how to do a lot of other things besides music composition. Mm -hmm. I had done some sound design before, but I really started uh, learning a lot more about sound design too, so that I could kind of be like a one-stop shop for game audio. Mm -hmm. um, and then basically I left my career in HR, because when you graduate with a music degree, what do you do? Uh, you mm -hmm. go to HR. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, so where were you I doing never really HR back. at? What's that? Where were you doing HR at? I was working at a retirement community, actually, oh. in Marin County. Nice. Yeah, and it was a great job. Just uh, uh, not really what I wanted to do full time. Mm -hmm. So you got your degree in music. Specifically, what music mm -hmm. theory? What kind of music degree did you end up getting? Yeah, it's basically music composition, like classical music composition. Um, but I took a lot of different classes. I did a lot of ethnomusicology. That was a big interest of mine. Yeah. Um, and singing, a lot of vocal repertory and piano repertory. So, And, of course, the piano helped a lot with the composition. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's a very different path. A lot of sound designers and composers for games... Uh, took more of an engineer route, but all of that stuff I've been teaching myself since maybe 1997 or so, when like MIDI was super cool, and yeah, I would, and you know, I started digital recording too then. So mm -hmm. I kind of learned that on my own. I took a few classes. So um, you were saying uh, early on you were doing some some MIDI stuff for like early games. Is is that correct? Yeah, I did a lot of MIDI. I used to have a website. I think it still exists because I, I never deleted it called Aaron Walls' MIDI Home. Uh -huh. uh, and I think it's MIDIShack.net. I think it's still there. Um, <laughs> I still pay for it, so, but well, it hasn't been updated in a long time. But yeah, uh, I did, um, by ear, I would do game music mm -hmm. um, and uh, put it up there for people to listen to. And then I also did custom composition and then I did some freebies for people for indie games and um, yeah I kind of got my start there and there are some people today honest to God when I just posted on LinkedIn someone wrote me and said I've been following you since those days <laughs> so I can't believe those that days. but there you go I love the emphasis on those days <laughs> yeah it's a long time ago <laughs> right right so um, for an audio uh, composition person for video games what would you consider like the absolute necessity for equipment like what do you need to to compose and design music if you were going to try and do it yourself yeah so uh 
I would say it's not really necessarily about how much fancy gear you have or like the best, most expensive gear, but you do have to have a lot of knowledge about it. So um, having a, a digital audio workstation like, um, you know, um, I use Sonar, Cakewalk Sonar, but Pro Tools is a big industry standard. There's Logic, there's Digital Performer, yeah, there's a lot of options. But if you Ableton, really know right. what you're doing with one of those, any of those will do. Mm -hmm. Whether you're on PC or Mac, it's not a problem. Um, that's where you're going to do a lot of the, you know, arrangement and um, software sampling and all of that stuff to, like, you know, make. Th this is music specifically, I guess I'm talking about. Um, if you're talking about sound design, too, you also need that. Um, but you need more of a like a, a simple wave editor. Mm -hmm. um, so we do a lot of work in those. Basically, I'll do sound design in a, in a DAW in, in Sonar. So I'll layer a bunch of things and yeah. then make a session and then export them. But then you have to edit all of that stuff, um, take out the, the, the start and the stops. You might need to compress them a little bit, take out little pops. I mean, all sorts of editing happens in sound design, and that's where you need something like SoundForge mm -hmm. is a big one that people use. Um, but the, again, there's a lot of options depending on Mac or PC. So those two things are like super duper important as far as software. And then like almost any computer these days can handle a certain amount of tracks and, and all of that. When you need to get something fancier is when you're talking about using like a multi-thousand dollar sample library and putting together like a like a very film, you know, classical score with like 30 different instruments playing all at once, then you might need like a more powerful computer. But for most sound design and simple composition, yeah. You don't need anything super fancy. You need the knowledge, though. You need to yeah. know how to use it. Knowing your equipment and your software in, in depth is more important than having the best and latest equipment. Absolutely. I read cool. the entire Sonar manual that's like, I'll just say it's 700 pages. I don't even know. And I had used it my whole life, pretty much. Um, and I learned like eight things that I didn't know. And some nice. of them are like super time saver. So shortcut it was worth keys the pain. and stuff are, are really shortcut important. Keys. There's one crazy one where if if the audio clips somewhere and you get a little peak, you know, but mm -hmm. you're not sure where it clipped, you can right click on the bar and it will like display, it will go to where that happened. <laughs> and I mean, that's so not intuitive. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool but though. I just learned that. <laughs> so, nice. Yeah. So I was gonna comment on your shirt, Waltz Music. I think uh, oh, yeah. I've seen this design and stuff before. I, I really enjoy your uh, your music and your art and stuff. So I uh, I wanted to call out your shirt to everybody on, on stream today. And uh, so the, uh, the next thing I was going to ask you about, I completely forgot and I should have written it down, but it was mm -hmm. uh, along the lines of um, uh, when we were talking about the zooms and doing like sound sampling and kind of getting your own library of sounds and stuff. How helpful yeah. has that been over the years? I mean, is that more for other stuff that you're doing or is that helpful in game sounds? Oh my gosh. So yeah. So, I mean, I've talked about this a lot at Casual Connect. There's a misconception of sound design, uh, especially in indie circles, that you just go to a sound library and buy everything, or maybe even worse, a free library, and just like download sounds and like dump them into your game. And um, that's not good sound design. It's coverage. But if you're gonna like go for something artful, it's not gonna work. So uh, along those lines, kind of just out of a fun project, I, I bought a Zoom recorder, mm -hmm. which is just a, a simple little portable digital microphone recorder that that uh, you can take with you wherever you go. And I started recording specifically a lot of ambiences, yeah, because that was something I could never find like online, like the very specific ambiences I wanted to find. Um, so like. When I went to Europe, I I started recording cobblestones and like various vehicles going over the cobblestones because mm -hmm. it's just not something we have in San Francisco, um, and like parks um, and wildlife. When I went to Mexico, I recorded a thunderstorm and 
got really close thunder and ended up using that in uh, in Minecraft story mode at Telltale. So I guess when you're creative like that and you, you record a lot of sounds, it's like it's so fun to use your own sounds instead of just going and downloading something that maybe a lot of other people have used before. Mm-hmm. And then um, it also gives you stuff that you can layer on to other stuff that you might need to purchase. So, you know, it's really an art of mixing and kind of blending different sounds. But I made a library of several thousand sounds, I think. And everything from what I just said to like, I remember once when I worked at Kabam, I love the sound of the lock in the lobby um, bathroom. You'd go in this very echoey space and you mm-hmm. lock it. It sounds like a castle, almost like click, you know, but like with this big reverb. Mm. And so I went in there with my Zoom recorder and just recorded it. And then I used it at, uh, for um, Heroes of Camelot for a, a siege scene. Of course, I edited it and made it bigger, but that was like the kind of the basis of that sound. So that kind of thing, I think it's also something worth investing in. And it's not very expensive to get one of those. Yeah. I I think they're they're super cool. I've I've got one myself and and they're really cool, you know, to get those ambient sounds that you just run into across. And they're super small and portable and easy to use and I found that to be really cool. Um mm-hmm. so I guess the other set of topics I wanted to talk to you about is uh, what it's like to be an audio designer as a business person. You know, running, you do your own business. You've also recently worked at Kabam and Telltale and stuff. What's the pros and cons of doing it on a consultant side? And what's the pros and cons of working for a big company doing it? Kind of that whole diatribe. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I contracted externally for for many years um and you get used to it but you do have to be uh relentless i guess in a lot of ways uh you can't give up when things are slow you have to constantly reach out to clients that you've already worked with and clients that you would like to work with Mm -hmm. um and that can be really difficult if you have trouble just being really direct with people i mean i would just write hundreds of people. And not only that, but um, you have to be able to handle a lot of rejection or a lot of like, oh, we don't have anything. Um, Because out of like 100 emails, I might get one job on a good day. Mm -hmm. And when you're busy with work, you can never rest on your laurels. You have to constantly look at the door like, okay, I'm going to be done, you know, in on November 30th. What am I going to do after that? So You know, there's a lot of organization. I mean, I've worked as an HR director and as a project manager. So I think those two things have really helped me be organized. If you're not organized, um, contracting and audio uh, is going to be really difficult because I've worked for like eight clients at once. And then you have to keep track of all the deadlines, all the meetings Mm-hmm. and make each person feel like they're the only person that matters to you. <laughs> so have you always done this as a solo kind of adventure? Or have you had people come on and work with you as a consultant? I have had people come on and work with me. So um, I've contracted out various things from accounting to website to social media to helping me at the conferences, mm-hmm. actually going to each of the booths and meeting people and representing Walls Music and Sound. Um, because yeah, you just can't really do it all alone. So, uh, I have done some of that. Um, and so what I would say about being in-house is that, uh, in a way it's like you have to do like one thing, like this is the games we're working on. Like, you know, so it feels at first like, oh, I can't be as creative, but, um, the there's a lot of stability that feels really nice and especially i get to work with other sound designers so both Mm -hmm. kabam and telltale had a department of sound designers and an audio director so i got to actually like learn a lot more and work with them collaborative Um, kind of stuff what's that you could collaborate you could bounce ideas off each other and and kind of work more as like maybe a band would where they have you know three or four musicians with ideas to you know kind of advance what you're going to do Yeah. And we all had different backgrounds. You know, some of them had only worked in house. Some Mm -hmm. of them had never contracted. Um, And so I came in, especially to Telltale, with a lot of um, 
more interactive experience um, because Telltale's games for Telltale fans out there are very linear and like cinematic. Mm -hmm. So the design is similar to film, um, but they have the puzzles and the free walks and those are more like games. And so those I always wanted to work on because that was like where my strength and familiarity was. Right. So, but, uh, but other people were the opposite. So that was really nice that you end up doing exactly what you love where you contract, you have to, you can't really say no to anything. And that's the mistake a lot of people make. If it sounds kind of something that you don't really want to do, you kind of still have to do it. <laughs> yeah. So what about uh, any like bad contracts? Have you run into things where you didn't get paid, the game died and just didn't do well and they had no money to pay you and stuff like that? Have you run into those problems? Yeah. So I ran into that kind of a two different situations twice. Um, but after that, um, I basically, if you create a nice contract for yourself that basically gets you paid up front mm -hmm. and or uh, not the full amount, but some amount and or like milestones. So that's the keys like say, OK, I'm going to deliver this many sounds in one month and you're going to owe me this much, you know, and I expect and, payment at this milestone. And yeah. Yeah, and the big mistake that I made at the beginning was kind of just like, okay, well, you can pay me at the end. And then, like you said, the game gets canceled, and it's really awkward because they don't have any money, mm -hmm. or they're not going to make any money, and um, it's just really uncomfortable. So I had that, and I had a situation also where someone, like, hired me, used me for a little while, and then, like, basically hired someone else <laughs> without telling me and didn't pay me for my work. Yeah. So... You definitely have to be like super clear at the beginning about what your expectations are. And it can be a little awkward at first, but I just get to, I get a sense of people's buy-in and their commitment to me mm -hmm. and the project at the beginning. And if I'm not feeling like they're going to pay me, it's not going to be something that I'm going to take. Not at this point. Right. So do you deal with mostly like long-term relationships at this point, or do you have like a lot of new people that you haven't worked with a lot that you're, you're working with now? You know, I get both. So I've had some clients that I've worked with for years and years on many games or every game that they do. Um, mm -hmm. And some of these small companies don't make a lot of games, so it might not be, you know, that often. And then often some random company will come about that heard about me from some other game or a talk or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I have both pretty much new yeah. and long-term clients. Cool. So yeah. um, I was reading your Skype profile today, and it uh, said something along the uh, lines of sounds and music and oh my and stuff, and I found that interesting. But the other part was uh, it reminded me of uh, the game Audio Alliance. Um, yes. What's, what is that, and what's its status? Ah, that's a good question. Okay, so 2006, 2007, 2008 um, – I was getting more and more involved at Casual Connect. I became a speaker. I don't remember what year I became the MC. Mm -hmm. Maybe 2007. I don't know. For the audio track. Um, and then I became an advisor. So I got more and more involved. I got to meet everyone, all the audio people. And I forged some relationships. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, those relationships are essentially myself, um, Greg Ron, um, who is the director over at Kabam. Um, Jesse Holt, who was at um, Double Down and various other companies. Right. Um, and then Barry Dowsett and Kevin Tone from the Sound Rangers, which mm -hmm. is a big sound library in Seattle. Yep. Um, and we all became like beer buddies and audio buddies and hangout buddies. And they all spoke at the Casual Connect. And they kind of like just looked to me for organization and leadership. So we just kind of all decided together that we wanted to create um, an organization because there weren't a lot of like big audio companies, mm -hmm. big, I mean, it wasn't big, but you know, there's a lot of independent contractors and we wanted to kind of create like a, an in-house company that really focused on high quality audio as well as education mm -hmm. for not only other sound designers and especially new sound designers because we saw a lot of practices we didn't like but also um, for developers to mm -hmm. learn a little bit more about like what goes into audio, why you're paying us, like why 
you know, it takes that much work and that much time and why it's important, like what, what kind of impact it can have on the player. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, we did that for a few years until Greg got the job at Kabam, Mm -hmm. um, and he was prohibited from working on anything else. So he left the game audio Alliance. We did a few more projects. Mm -hmm. We, we definitely were still active in the speaking department. Um, and, you know, I mean, we're still all friends and there's been a lot of talk about uh, revi- or re- revitalizing that, recreating it um, probably more in the educational route. Mm-hmm. Um, I just talked to Jesse a few days ago and he was super like pumped up about being a part of Casual Connect again. Awesome. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, that could come back. It never really died. It's just that we, we're not doing work together as a Game Audio Alliance anymore. Right. Um, yeah. So, let's see. I was uh, going to ask you about basically the future. Where's uh, Actually, there was one other thing I wanted to ask you about before I asked you about where you were going in the future, and that was um, some of the smaller game devs, they use... Um, like an audio pack, like they'll buy like I think Sound Ragers and some of these other guys. They'll give you like a CD with like ten thousand or a hundred thousand sounds and stuff on it. And then your business is more along the lines of creating custom, unique sounds for that situation in the game. Um, yeah. So there's going to be a balance for some of these indie developers on you know, okay, I've just got to take this sound pack and use what makes sense that I can find in that just because of budget reasons. But mm-hmm. it kind of taking the game to the next level would be kind of making custom sounds. You know, um, is that is that kind of accurate? Am I off on that or? Well, so there's two things I would say. One is uh, the sounds themselves, what whatever the your sounds are, whether they're custom or from a pack, they're probably only fifty percent of the success of sound design in your game. Mm-hmm. So uh, the implementation of it is going to be really super important. So, for example, you could have the coolest laser blast ever, Mm -hmm. but if you use the same one every time, it's going to sound really annoying very quickly. Right. So, you know, sound designers do things like create a lot of variations of one sound so that it randomizes everything. Um, and so if you don't know how to do that and you just put in like one sound for a lot of things, it's going to be really flat, um, and 2d and, you know, just not, not interesting and immersive. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's one. And then two, yeah, a lot of these sound packs, sound designers, the way we combine and mix sound in a scene, Mm -hmm. we're not really concerned about the sound of the sound effect we're putting in, we're concerned about where it is in the mix. So if you have music playing, ambience, like wind or something, um, voiceover possibly, and sound design, they're all going to fight each other if you don't do it in a smart way. And so all of these sounds have a certain um, location in the frequency of sound, you know, Mm -hmm. high pitch, low pitch, mid. So we do a lot of things like EQing, editing and EQing sounds so that maybe if there's bassy music and I make like sword hits, I'm going to EQ some of the bass out of that sound for that scene because it's going to create mud and it's going to make that range too loud and so that the rest of the mix is not being heard. Right. So, you know there's a lot more to sound design and audio than like finding the right sound effect and sticking it in. And like I said, that will be coverage, but you know, how often anyone who has a serious game in mind that they want to be really quality, how often do they not revise or consider every aspect of the art or every aspect of the story Mm -hmm. or the gameplay or the programming efficiency, you know, all these various things that you iterate and tweak. But for some reason, people forget that audio is also in need of iteration and considering all these other things. It can't just be thrown in at the end and, and, and thrive. So, so w- yeah. would you consider audio probably the number one overlooked aspect of a video game to kind of put the finding the finishing polish on a video game? 
Absolutely. I mean, if it's thrown in at the last minute, mm -hmm. it's going to be night and day not as good as if you consider it from the de design. I mean, there's so many games that like have little things that even I played recently, like, like you know, like the way that like Super Mario 3D World, when you jump underwater, it changes the frequency and the instrumentation of the mm -hmm. music to reflect that. Yeah. That's not something that was thrown in at the last minute. That was something that was planned in the design. Right. That so was early on design the, thoughts. Yes. So those touches where you're creating a lot of different triggers, like where the character is or what the time is or whether it's night or day or whatever those variations are, the more like immersive you can make your sound, you know, the the better the game is going to be. And this I mean, I've done a lot of games now, and it's so rare that somebody really values audio in that way, where mm -hmm. they give us enough time and be able to work interdisciplinary, you know, with other departments. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that covers pretty much everything I had on my list of things that I was going to ask you about today. But uh, the final question is usually, you know, what do you see for the future of uh, Aaron Waltz and uh, where, where are you going? Oh. And also, you should tell people where they can get a hold of you if they want to use you for sound as well. So both those things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's easy to search for me. Um, so wallsmusic.com. There's no T in that. So W-A-L-Z is in zebra, music.com. That has uh, all the games I've worked on that aren't already, you know, that aren't like secret. Mm -hmm. um, it has links to my so videos of my work, uh, sound clips. Uh, you can reach me there. I, I, you can reach me at Aaron at wallsmusic.com. Uh, it's A-A-R-O-N. Um, I'm on Twitter, Walls Music. I'm pretty much on all the f social medias as Walls Music. So easy to okay. find. Um, I work with big and small companies. So don't be afraid to reach out. And I love to give free advice too. So, you know, I just basically I want all games to sound good. So <laughs> if you reach out to me, I'm going to I'm going to help you. Um, and as far as What's going on with me? Um, you know, I told you already, Carl, but Telltale just laid off 25% of their staff. So mm -hmm. I was unfortunately one of those people. Um, and they're kind of, they got a new CEO and, you know, they had a lot of success after Walking Dead. And since then, we haven't had a big hit. So right. um, they're, they're paring down and, you know, working on less and trying to, you know, specifically target some success. But um, so I'm pretty free. I, I'm working at a, a karaoke app uh, called Star Maker. Mm -hmm. So that's a fun app, If by the way. You can download it on iPhone and share your, you can record yourself with video, basically. And there's MIDI <laughs> tracks uh, that I create. Oh, nice. And, I, and I, I mix the backing tracks and all that. So it's super fun. Uh, and I love music and I love MIDI, so that's a really good mix for yeah. me. Yeah, I have um, to say that I did karaoke for the first time, honestly, for the first time in Seattle, right before the show in Seattle at Casual Connect. Went there oh, with wow. my best friend, and it was my first time doing karaoke, and it was fun <laughs> and nerve-wracking at the same time. So I, I can't really imagine myself taking a video of myself singing uh, yet, but maybe if I was really into karaoke, that would be really kind of fun. Yeah. But yeah, you can just save it internally too and, you know, critique yourself. You don't send, have to share it. Send it to your mom who loves you enough to actually <laughs> not, you know, flay you for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, doing that, working with Namco Bandai on some mm -hmm. games, which is super cool. Um, and then, yeah, I have my 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 regular clients. I, I get to work with John Romero sometimes, which is like one of my game audio heroes. And mm -hmm. he's very knowledgeable about game audio too. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm looking for another full-time gig. I would like to be in-house again. I like the stability. I like working with other people. So definitely putting that out there to all you <laughs> recruiters. Awesome. Well, if anyone comes uh, my way, I'll definitely give you a high recommendation. You've been uh, amazing to work with, and you're uh, truly one of the people that I feel like puts... Like you were saying before, you are out there to help people and you put information out there and you just want to make the games better for everybody and stuff. And and it shows in your attitude and your uh, the way you do things. And so I, I truly appreciate that and I want to thank you for that. 
So, um, and I also want to thank you for coming on the show today. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, so thanks for taking the time out of your day and uh, your lovely San Francisco weather. Um, <laughs> it's very nice today. Actually. Oh, okay. Well, I should have <laughs> It's really <you> warm. <laughs> nice. Well, get outside and have some fun then. And uh, All right. thanks again. And uh, we'll talk to you um, probably in Disneyland. All right. Thanks, Carl, for everything you guys do. Really appreciate you. Always have. All right. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Yeah, take care. Bye.